explain some things to you about Dr. Japan aircraft and some of the reasons behind what goes on here. Uh, I'm not affiliated with any fan manufacturer or anything like that. Byron treats me no better than they treat anybody else. Uh, most of my aircraft are designed around the Byron fan. The reason why is I feel it's the best fan on the market. It has the, the very most power. And you'll have to, by the way, when I'm talking about all this, I want to explain something to you. I am not a professional uh, uh, lecturer or anything like that, so please excuse my, my talking. I, I just pretty much I can get across the point I have to give you, but uh, uh, please excuse my words sometimes. But anyway, uh, the Byron unit produces the most power, although in order to produce that amount of power, it does sacrifice some tailpipe velocity. So I don't make any airplanes that you can dive out of the sky from 5,000 feet and get up to 200, 240 miles per hour and then. And if that's the sort of stuff that impresses you uh, uh, or you're looking for, uh, you, you bought the wrong tape or, or wasting time because I'm not into that game. Uh, but uh, I, I try to build you an airplane that will have superior qualities in, in various different areas. One in the, in the ease of construction, the simplicity of the aircraft, the flight characteristic of the aircraft, uh, I want to be a, a, uh, uh, a happy medium where you have an airplane that not only is, is large, which automatically flies better than a smaller airplane, an airplane that is, has good takeoff and landing characteristics, can be taken off of grass, short takeoff roll, and leave the ground with great authority. You've all seen a lot of these airplanes that require a very long run, and then you have to go quite a ways of, of, of distance getting some altitude before you can even turn the airplane. I, I don't make any airplanes like that. I, I wouldn't even do that. Uh, so uh, that's what we're trying to accomplish here. Not being associated with any fan person, uh, the Dynamax or, any of the, or the Violet fan or, or Turbaxes or, or Byron fan, I'm generally picking a fan that I feel will do the job the best. Uh, I like the fact that if you'll notice it, if you see all the, the kits that we're going to show you, stuff like that, you'll notice that the, the engines are all right side up. There's not gaping holes in the bottom of the fuselages. For, for cheater holes. Uh, but when you pull the, the single hatch, you're not having to open another hatch to get inside a duct tube. It, it, you don't have throttle lines and fuel lines and everything else that is inside this duct tube and got to be routed around the tanks and you know, tanks here and there and everywhere and, and inaccessible to them. And, and your airplane winds up weighing a tremendous amount of weight because of the, the stuff that's in there. If an aircraft is engineered properly, it should be very simple to build because there isn't uh, the less pieces that are needed. It makes the airplane that much simpler to build. There's a lot of people on the market that are, are have airplanes out there and they say, well, this is a good trainer. Uh, one of them is your, your T-33, P-80, your F-86, and these people claim they are good trainers. And, Boy, this airplane you should buy because of the trainer. You know, that the technology of those designs goes back to about 1945 on most of those airplanes, and that's just how old the whole concept of the whole aircraft is. Different platforms of aircraft will, will give you different, different features. If you take a straight wing, for example, the stall characteristics of a straight wing are extreme and they'll almost always tip stall on you. This is the characteristic of a straight wing. But they'll tip stall. Well, yeah, we all use washout and different airfoil shapes and, and stuff like that to try to compensate for all this. But if you're bringing an airplane in and you're, you're, you got a dead stick, the, 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 you got a little headwind, stuff like this, 
these airplanes will the airplanes will stall so quickly that even with all these washouts and everything else, the wing stalls at such a rate of speed that none of that really means anything. The airplane is still going to tip stall on you. When we talk about a trainer, we want to talk about an airplane that is not necessarily easy to fly because basically if the airplane is designed right, they're all easy to fly. To me, a trainer is an airplane that has good takeoff characteristics and good landing characteristics. These are the requirements that a trainer should have. Now, there are certain platforms, like your Delta, when we talk of straight wings with tip stall characteristics, we talk of the Delta platform, it is incapable of tip stall. Some of your later designs, uh, to, to go right to the YF-22, for example, which is just about as new as you can get, this type of a platform here is incapable of tip stalling. No matter how slow you get this airplane, it will not tip stall. When the airplane does start to slow down, if you have it in an attitude like this, and the airplane starts to tip stall, what will happen is it will, it will try to tip stall, but the, air, the airframe will correct itself and it will drop the nose forward. You'll see the, the nose wag a little bit as it goes stall, and then suddenly the nose will fall forward. You pull out of that and you're out of your stall. That, to me, is a trainer. Your F-86, these airplanes here, the lift is all generated in the wings. Even this here has hardly any better stalling characteristics than this one. You'll notice that these are flying on the wings. There is no lift being generated in the fuselage at all. Uh, Rich Yerovich one time in, in an article was talking about my T-38. He says, geez, this airplane flies remarkably well considering how small the wings are. Well, that, that, that tells you something. You know, uh, a person doesn't have any concept of, of what's going on there. You see, this airplane has this much wing. If you look at a T-38, everything you're looking at is, is lift. The fuselage is generating about 40% of the lift. So therefore, the wings can be smaller because the fuselage is also generating lift. Your F-4 is the same thing. If you want, when you're testing, you're using gliders to test to locate uh, aerodynamic main cords, uh, CGs, all this other stuff. In order to make a proper glider for testing, you have to take the whole aircraft in consideration. You have to design a, a, a glider that has all the profiles. Same thing with the YF-22 here. You'll see you actually have to build this type of a glider, show the profile of the fuselage, to get the true effect of what the, what the real model is going to do. On these type of non-flying fuselages, all you're dealing with is wings and nothing else is really going to mean anything to you because they're not generating a lift there. Another person wrote an article recently about saying these airplanes are the, the YF-22, the F-4, the F-16, uh, all these aircraft as real aircraft are extremely unstable. And when you make a model of the airplane, you're dealing with an uns extremely unstable platform. This is this is a statement that hasn't really been followed through with the reason behind this. Yes, the real aircraft is very unstable. There's a reason behind that. The, the reason why the airplane is very unstable is because the center of gravity of the aircraft has been placed so far to the rear so that the fighter, the real fighter, is capable of producing a 10G turn. The computer flies the aircraft, maintains the stability of the airplane. When the pilot, by moving the stick, requests the airplane to do a maneuver, the computer actually does the maneuver for him because the computer knows what the airplane can do and what the pilot can survive. In order for the computer to actually fly this aircraft, the airplane has to be an extremely stable platform. It's just by where they have located the CG, center pitch, everything else, the way they locate this is what makes the airplane unstable. When we make a model of this aircraft, if we locate the CG where we need it for a flying model, you wind up with an extremely stable aircraft. Uh, if you've ever seen any of the videos, which you're going to see shortly, of the YF-22 flying, we have a video of the YF-22 dead sticking. And uh, uh, if you dead stick this airplane uh, to, to a standing ovation when it comes down. 
It's, it's not because I did that great a job of landing the airplane. It's just because the airplane does that. The airplane is its own company. So that, there, there's a lot to be, be thought about when, when we're talking about stability of aircraft and, and that sort of stuff. But there's a lot more involved in saying, this airplane in 1945 was a trainer or an easy airplane. It makes an easy flying model. What I'm trying to tell you is, is, is those designs are old. There, there's a, the reason why these airplanes are on the market is not because they were trainers or they would make good flying airplanes. It's because the, the, what, the real, what really is going on in there, I'm going to tell you, is, is they're building the airplane around their fan. If you were to take the YF-22 for an example, and try to build this and fly and power this with a small fan, what you'll run into, the problems you'll run into, the reason why you can't do it is because the new jets use a turbofan type system, which is almost identical to what we're using. We're actually using a turbofan. We're using a gas engine to turn an impeller. They're using a jet engine, but the jet engine is not the power of the aircraft anymore. The fan that the jet engine turns is now as much the power as the actual jet exhaust. These old airplanes flew off of nothing more than the jet exhaust. And they had small intakes, small exhaust. If you want to build a big airplane and you want to use a small fan in it, you can't have big intakes and big exhaust. If you have too much air into the airplane, more air than the fan can use, that's drag. If you've got a small exhaust hole, out of the back of the airplane, like the old airplanes has, you can use it on the smaller fan. You need to pick an airplane that has that. If you have very large holes, like the, the F-4 or the YF-22 or something like this, you have a very large hole, they've got to fake that down so small and put an inner duct tube in there to make that hole because you can't just have the intakes and the exhaust. All that has to be done by a computer and is done by a computer to determine the size of the intakes and the size of the exhaust in order to get your airplane to fly properly. So when you come when you come using a smaller fan, that's why you can't use some of these airplanes. And if you want to, you have to put two of them in there. I don't have a single airplane on the market that uses a Byron fan that you can put any other fan in there and expect the same performance. There is no aircraft on the market that requires a smaller fan that you would put the bigger fan in and you would get, except for speed, you would still have performance and still be capable of flying the airplane. If you put a Bob Violet fan in a YF-22, it'd never leave the ground. You just wouldn't have, you wouldn't have enough, enough power to fly the airplane at all. Because of the simplicity of the design of the aircraft, and the power that the Byron fan puts out, I can produce you an airplane, as you'll see in the, the tapes, I can produce you an airplane that will weigh 11 pounds, and you have about 14, 15 pounds of thrust. This is a power to weight ratio that will give you these very short takeoffs and leaving the ground with great authority. In the, in the construction tape that, that we have made, we've totally built the T-38, got it completely ready to paint, put it on a pole for scale for you, and the airplane you can see, totally ready to fly, less paint weights, only 10 and a half pounds. However amount of weight you add in your paint job is going to determine the, the weight of this airplane. Now, if you put a whole pound of weight on there, you've still only got an 11 and a half pound airplane. You've got an 80 inch long fuselage, 48 inch wingspan airplane. You've got this larger airplane, and still only weighing about 11 pounds with 14 pounds of thrust. The F-4 is the same is the same game. You put it down a runway, you advance the throttle, you rotate 80 feet, you go 80 feet, you pull up on the stick, the airplane leaves the ground, boom, and goes up. I mean, I've been to fan flies and, and have demonstrated that kind of takeoff with people, and now they say, now that's power. Well, they're right. That's what it is. Same thing applies on these type of airplanes. When you're coming in for a landing, you get botched up. When you advance the throttle on the aircraft, the airplane instantly takes off again because you have such extreme power to weight ratio. Yeah. A 
seen one person that built a new kit on the market. He's very, very proud of it. It's a, he's done a lot of, of uh, flying the airplane. It's a very large airplane. And he had a Dynamax in it. If you've ever watched the airplane fly, it goes great downwind. After it's taken forever to get off the ground, it goes great downwind. Because of the power in relationship to the weight of the aircraft, when it goes into turn, it loses a tremendous amount of speed. When it goes upwind, it wallers all the way upwind, never getting any speed built up, although the Dynamax has tremendous tail flight velocity, there's not enough power to bucket. It wallers all the way upwind, turns around, and then downwind and takes off again and goes down the wind. This airplane, it would be astounding if this person was there to take that airplane and put a Byron fan in there see the difference in performance he would have, he'd be absolutely amazed. He really would. Everybody seems to be looking for too much speed. And this too much speed has a tendency to give you a poor flying airplane sometimes. Uh, I don't want to, I don't want to try to put that sort of stuff on the market and I don't want to over-engineer the kit. Over-engineering the kit is something that a lot of people do. And some of them have to have that. They have to have all this intake ducting and exhaust and all this stuff seems to work better for the airplane, especially if you want to go 200 miles per hour or you have this type of airplane that requires this intake ducting stuff. All it does is just make the airplane heavier, harder to work with on a Byron fan unit. I haven't found a single one of them yet that really has any benefit to try to put intake ducting in any Byron powered airplane, and we have tried that. It's really never proved any benefit other than that, like you say, it took time, took weight, uh, took effort, made the things hard to get to, et cetera, et cetera, and it really didn't improve the performance of the airplane at all. So I, I don't get too much into, into that. So if a person asks me, they say, well, what is a good trainer? That's what I tell them. Really looking for a good trainer, you want an airplane that's easy to build, simple aircraft, ease of maintenance, ease of service, has good takeoff and landing characteristics designed in the airframe of the aircraft. And I think that's what we accomplish here. And I think if you really think about it, I think you're going to realize that you're going to get that with my kids, and you're not going to get that in a lot of other places. Okay, I'm going to show you the kits now, and as you're looking at these at these aircraft, uh, I want you to, to kind of keep a few things in, in, in mind and, and notice them as you're looking at them. Uh, notice the, 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 the landing gear stance of, of these aircraft. Uh, they, accessibility of, of uh, the internal parts of the aircraft, and the simplicity of the construction, and stuff like that. It, it, it's it's uh, pretty pretty self-evident that you'll notice right away how, how how the airplane goes together very simply and how, how easy it is to get to everything. There, there there's some magazines out there that I also want to bring your attention to. There's Two magazines. Uh, they printed the article twice because they felt the article was as good as I felt it was. I spent about a year researching fuel systems and the proper way to set up the fuel system. I, I've noticed in the amount of fans I've gone, fan flies I've gone to, the the biggest cause of people losing their aircraft is because of an engine failure of some sort. And I spent a year in researching and studying and testing different items to find out what is the really best way to set up the, the engine in the aircraft. And, and I wrote an article about that. And it, it was published in, in Scale RC Modeler, the March 1993 issue. It's in that one. And then it was published again in the Jet Powered, nothing but on, strictly on jets, but this issue here, which is uh, uh, Volume 1, 1993, and it's strictly on scale jets. But, both of these magazines have the have the, the article on setting up fuel systems. And I really suggest that you read that, find that article and read that article. I don't care what airplane you're building 
I believe that the information that I spent a whole year getting for you and putting in these articles, and I don't get paid for these kind of articles, I just do it because I feel it's a real important thing and I feel it will really help you. So I suggest you find it and read it. You know. If you are interested in some magazines that, that deal strictly with uh, with my kids, Scale RC Modeler, the, the September 1991 issue has my airplanes on the cover along with my wife, and there's a, a major article in there on the, on the T-38s. Anybody, anybody that is, that is, wants to use a Byron fan and is looking for maximum performance, I feel sorry for them if they don't have a T-38. I really feel sorry for them. Another issue, June of 88, has a complete issue on the, the a complete article on the F-8 Crusader. It's also on the cover and has a complete article on there and how that airplane is built. Uh, Model Shopper has, has the F-4 in it. Scale RC Modeler in 85 has my A-10 major article on that. We did a fun article on the uh, on our Phantom 3, which is a a canard version of the F4. We just kind of had a fun article on that thing, and that's in uh, uh, May of '89. It's also on the cover with an old girlfriend, and, and that's uh, that's another magazine. It's kind of fun to read about our work on on converting an F4 to our own design. You know. Uh, as you're looking at the, the video of these airplanes flying, keep in mind that I'm really not into this video stuff too much. A lot of this footage you have is just stuff that people took for me. They were not pros with the camera and they were, I just got it or they gave me a copy of it or I, uh, some of it I filmed myself, but it's not really the best of stuff. But, but look beside all of that and just, observe the, the performance of the aircraft. There are some companies out there that have a bunch of, of pro pilots that, that are, are sponsored by them and represented them. They come to these fan flies and these are just that. They're pro pilots that are out there to fly these aircraft and make these airplanes fly and look as good as they can look. That really doesn't give you a true story of how you're going to do with this airplane unless you're in that category too. And uh, all, I don't have anybody like that. We just do our own flying and we do the best we can and, and none of us claim to be of that caliber of pilots. A lot of the people that have uh, fly my airplanes are, are are just normal Joes like us too. You know? And when you go to a fan fly and you see somebody fly in an airplane, you have to take that all with a grain of salt, too. You, you, I've seen people say, geez, the airplane didn't fly well. But keep in mind, you don't know what that, that model builder did to that airplane. Maybe he had a ton of weight. Maybe the engine isn't running right. Maybe he doesn't do that right. Maybe he doesn't do that. He might not be a pro representative. I can guarantee you he's not a pro representative. And he's just going to be flying that airplane the best he can. Try to, try to figure out how you would do with the airplane. Because I can tell you, I don't have a single airplane on the market that I don't consider to be an outstanding flying airplane. I do suggest you follow the instructions, build the airplane the way I tell you to build it. I really do. You can make all your changes, your modifications, and things that you make or you think will make it work better. But you know, a lot of effort was put into the way I did it, and I can tell you the way I did it. It works, you know. So I want to get in that. You, you'll notice some of the some there's some airplanes out there that they tell you, well, when you build this airplane, you need to put a gyro in there, single axis. One airplane says you even need a three axis gyro in the airplane to make the airplane fly right, make it be able to get up and down a runway or down a runway or whatever, you know. You know uh, this should tell you something. It should really tell you something when the manufacturer of the airplane tells you the airplane needs a gyro. I mean, think about it, you know. 
So and, uh, I'll give you an example. We have a we made a, a, a an F-23 Phantom III, and we took an F-4 Phantom, developed into a canard. In the video, I'll even, there'll be a piece of video on there showing the airplane fly. And you know in the video, the airplane looks like it really flies great. But you can make an airplane look like it's flying great if, if you know what you're doing. You know the characteristics of that specific airplane. But you know, that F-23 at certain angles of attack at certain speeds because of the rotation of canards and the locations of the inboard ailerons on an F-4 Phantom, at a certain angle, this thing would wash out the ailerons completely. You'd have no aileron control of the airplane unless you got the nose down and got the speed up on the airplane. Being a typical canard, when you tried to land this airplane, instead of flaring like you did in a, in a normal aircraft with the high angle of attach and the canards, the airplane has a tendency to keep trying to flare up, and you're actually landing the airplane by giving down on the stick to stop the nose from going over on you. So you can make anything look good if you are a good flyer or you know the characteristics of that airplane. Uh, I don't put anything in the market that I have to make look good. You know, So just take all this footage of the flying and, and everything else and look through it See it how it applies to you. Notice, notice the performance. Notice how, how quick the aircraft will accelerate. Notice how quick the airplane will leave the ground. Notice at what angle of attack it will leave the ground at. Uh, things like this, and, and you'll see that it, it, it flies very well. There's some footage in here of my A-10 Warthog, which does everything but mix your drinks. The canopy works, the flaps work, everything works in the thing. I made an A-10 Warthog weighs 21 pounds using two 45 KMBs and two Turbax fans in them. You know that thing is a flying dream, even at 21 pounds. You build the airplane at 16, 17 pounds for sport flying, you have a twin engine pattern flying, flying airplane on your market that flies like the real A-10 does, and the real A-10's got characteristics that's, that's just something you got to see to believe. So I hope you enjoy this little, little tour of the kits and some of the flying footage of the, of the aircraft.